inspiration from your wonderful story. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Feel free to write me. So friends, we have uh, our today's um, second speaker of the day is uh, Professor Nishad Fatima. Professor Nishad Fatima is a senior principal scientist working at CSIR Central Leather Research Institute, Adayar, Chennai. And uh, she's my friend. We met at the common platform at Indian National Young Academy and where we found that, you know, we have similar interests and that similar interest is women in scientists, empowering women in scientists, encouraging women in scientists. And Fatima has been doing a lot many programs for encouraging girls and women scientists across the country. She is also a DART Fellowship awardee to carry out NMR studies at uh, Germany. Uh, she is a recipient of INSA Medal for Young Scientists uh, given by Indian National Academy of Engineers. She is also a recipient of Young Engineer Award by SER, Women Excellence Award, INSA DFG Visiting Scientist uh, Fellowship Award, She's a recipient of Young Scientist Award. She has many, many research publications, more than hundreds of research publications in highly reputed journal. And uh, she has received many recognition for her excellent research work. And um, she's a very, very humble, great human being. And when you re uh, interact with her, you will you'll come to know. And without taking much time, um, platform is your Nishad. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shalini, for your kind introduction. And uh, without uh, wasting much time, let me share the slides. Yes. Is it visible now? Yes, it's visible. Just make it uh, bigger. Yeah, sure. Is it yeah, fine? excellent. Excellent. Go ahead. Okay, right. So, a very good evening to one and all for listening to this lecture. Uh, well, as the slide here, the introductory slide shows that this is going to be more of um, uh, introduction to the world of women scientists who were then, when I, when I say then, it is in the early stages and to the current. And it's going to be filled with a lot of laughter and fun because that's the way to actually convey a serious message. Humor always gets the point through, you know. So this cartoon kind of depicts it. So, uh, well, this girl is asking this boy, you don't believe me, do you? Well, it's a fact that girls are smarter than boys. And uh, do you know who discovered it? Women scientists, of course. Well, have you heard this name Pocket Rocket? If I show you this picture, I'm sure there are about 100 participants and all will raise their hands to say who it is, right? The legendary Hussein Bolt. Okay. Now, if I show this picture, how many of you know her? Well, this is supposed to be for scientists and researchers, but I'm asking about sports because women are women everywhere, right? In the respective of the profession. So, this lady happens to be the first woman in history to win a hundred meters medals at three consecutive Olympics. And she's the only sprinter in the history to become a world champion in 100 meters four times. Okay? And that's not the best part of her career. No, what's the best part? In 2017, she took a break to deliver her first child. And in 2019, she comes back and becomes the oldest female sprinter at the age of 32. And the second most world title in 100 meters. That's Shirley Ann Fraser for you. So this is the victory of motherhood. So when we talk about uh, women, how do they cope up when they, when they have small children, like we also heard from the earlier speaker, this is a true inspiration. So from there, let us find out why are we even having this seminar? You know, why are we even conducting this webinar? Uh, where we're talking about this gender inequalities and how to empower women and so on. In fact, as uh, one of these famous orators, Simon Sinek, puts it, you always, you know, have to start with the why. 
people don't buy what you do rather they buy why you want to do it so instead of asking what and how we can you know work on upliftment of more women in science let us start with the why there was the, i would just ask you to do a very simple experiment not with test tubes and uh, high fanda you know equipments a very simple experiment just go to google take google images and just type footballer you will see that the entire screen is filled up with the images of men footballers and trust me women also play football i'm i'm sure you all will agree with that and when you type in ballet dancer you get one men and 20 women and same with the builder the men pictures are more compared to the women in fact zero there and for receptionist yes you get all women pictures there and the scientist is not bad i think uh, thanks to madam curie uh, so she also pops up there so we do have uh, uh, three women uh, pictures popping in for scientists so the question is as i said why is it so it is typically stereotyping you know we always say women are good for this so let them take up this profession men you know for the others if you actually go back when i say history way back you know uh, with about, about 3 uh, 37415 ce he was this mathematician by name hypatia uh, well she was the uh, daughter of theon who was the uh, member of the famed library of alexandria uh, you must by the name it says that you know it was built a city which was built by the emperor alexander in the mouth of nile and she was a very talented mathematician so what did she do in fact she is also an author of the treatise on euclid's theorems and she is the first mathematician to put forth the concept of solving pair of simultaneous equations and she was well respected as a teacher of mathematics in fact this is one of the uh, you know uh, creations of uh, hypatia teaching a class but uh, i will come back to what happened to her later on and uh, her inventions include uh, the hydrometer and the improved design of an astro lamp where you could predict the uh, movement of the planets and so on in fact of the 44 instruments which are used in astronomy hers ranks third even today if you do the ranking but it so happened that she started questioning or rather uh, she wanted to prove that you know you certain theorems which were against the general belief at that point so what happened uh, the people did not uh, i said the name people probably it is the men who did not you know appreciate her questioning and in fact she was uh, titled as a witch and burnt alive so that was in 370 ce well many universities in fact until even uh, you know uh, 1920 even oxford did not grant degrees to women so it is as recent as this 1920 and it took until 1945 for the royal society of london which is one of the oldest academies which is still in existence to admit its first women fellows in fact uh, there is one uh, noting of this uh, lady who says historian who says that for nearly 300 years the only permanent female presence at the royal society was a skeleton preserved in the society's anatomical collection so to that extent you know the royal society excluded women to give an example another example in those days when i say those days it's about 18th century now uh you must have heard i mean few people who are working in this uh, area of research you know a person by name hertha atten she in fact was the first woman to get a very famous prize called as hugues medal this is her portrait well she was uh, the third child of uh, this couple who a polish uh, watchmaker and her was alice moss a seamstress she in fact studied mathematics at cambridge but you know what Cambridge did not give her a degree because at that point of time, as I mentioned earlier, women were not even granted degrees from these elite colleges. So she completed an external examination and was awarded the degree from the University of London in 1881. And she published several studies on electrical arcs, and uh, she was the first woman to read her own paper. In fact, in those days, uh, the you know, it's like 
typical conference where you go and present your work. So she was the first woman to do that. And as I said, she was one of the two women until today to get this Hugus Prize. Now, what is this Hugus Medal? Uh, this is named after Hugus, who is a Welsh American scientist uh, who invented the first working radio communication system and the first microphone. To tell her story, you know, you have very interesting uh, stories about her. If you usually apply for any fellowship, you ask somebody to nominate, right? And they give you a very beautiful you know, letter stating that, highlighting your work and saying that why you are eligible for this fellowship. And you know what? In her case, she was a trailblazer, right? Uh, when her husband, in fact, happens to be a friend of, uh, uh, he is Bill Arton, uh, happens to be a friend of this Perry, who is now you know, nominating her, in a piece of paper, he just writes, I enclose a form of application for membership on behalf of Mrs. Peppa Arton, duly signed, I am gentleman, you are obedient, that's it. One line statement. So this, you know, goes on to say that he actually didn't want to nominate her, probably, you know, was forced to do it because he, Bill Arton, happened to be his friend. And the story continues. The then president of the Royal Society was William Huggins. And you can see from, you know, the medals he has received, what a renowned, decorated scientist he was. And the secretary was Sir Joseph Lamar, and he is, uh, again, uh, not a, a new name. He's one of the guys who talked about uh, splitting up the spectral lines in a magnetic field by oscillation of electrons. So these elite men were uh, now having the, uh, those days we didn't have emails, of course, the letter communication. And the letter goes like this. Thanks for the information. Uh, you know, they have elected her uh, to the society. So that's when this uh, president writes. I'm thankful you'll be safe in town on the 30th then. The papers will team with the presentation from the, all the advanced women. I suppose Lord Rayleigh, who happened to be the interim president because he was sick with flu. The president will invite her to the dinner and ask her to make a speech. As the only lady present, the president will have to seat her on his right hand. And all this comes from what appeared as a pure accident of my having a cold on Wednesday. So if probably he did not get that cold, she wouldn't have got a Hugues medal and neither the election to the Royal Society. And he goes on to write, Now, what the gods sent I must bear, but which of the gods sent me the cold? Was it good fortune on her behalf or why? Can we now refuse the fellowship? to a female medalist. This is history. So actually, as I said, this Hugo's medal is given for some original discovery uh, related to physical sciences. And it's not that, you know, uh, she didn't deserve it. She was truly a person deserving it because she had 26 patents to her credit. And uh, her discovery on this electric arc, uh, you know, is one of the pioneering work in that research field. And yet, she... You know, you can, you can see the communication between the president and the secretary of RSC debating about her fellowship. And trust me, it took one or two years from the day she was given the Hugues Medal for the second medal to be given. One or two years. And the second woman to get this Hugues Medal is none other than Michelle Duharty. Now, in fact, she is truly a stellar scientist because she is working on space research and um, uh, she received her medal for innovative use of magnetic field data that led to a discovery of an atmosphere around one of Saturn's moons and the way it revolutionized our view on the role of the planetary moons in the solar system. In fact, uh, it, uh, you know, her story is very interesting. At the age of 10, I think we should catch them young, you know, the phrase catch them in. At the age of 10, she was gifted a telescope by her father and that is where her interest and curiosity in space research uh, you know, uh, took uh, shape. And she went on to do her PhD from University of Natal, which is in South Africa. And then she moved on to Germany on a fellowship and right now she is the head of uh, the Imperial uh, College Physics Department. And uh, in fact, her pioneering work has been that, you know, she has been able to discover an atmosphere containing water and hydrocarbons around Saturn's moon. Uh, and it opens up new possibilities in search for life, you know, 
far away from uh, Earth. And she has also received the Royal Astronomical Society Gold Medal. And the past winners include Albert Einstein, Edwin Hubble, Arthur Remington, and Stephen Hawking. So she is truly a stellar scientist who truly deserves this medal. But imagine she got it after one or two years after the first women received it. And uh, to come back closer to my country, which is uh, India, uh, well, the history is 359 years of RSC. The first women FRS is Dr. Gangan Deep Kang. And uh, she is a scientist who, who uh, is the first woman, in fact, and the first ever, first Indian, and the first ever woman to edit Manson's textbook of tropical medicine. If you are a physician, you will know that uh, this is about 120 years old book. The so-called Manson's textbook of tropical medicine is a 120 years old book. And the first Indian, okay, male and female, and the first woman ever in the world to edit this book has been uh, Dr. Gagandeep. And she's basically, as I said, a physician, a medical scientist who has worked on diarrhea diseases and public health in India since the early 90s. And she played a pivotal role in devising and developing a vaccine, especially against rotavirus. Now, again, her life history, if you go back and see, uh, she's another uh, person, you know, at the age of 12. Uh, she used to see the leaves uh, images through a microscope, which her father bought. So I think this is the kind of message we you know, take from these uh, women that we have to inspire our girls very early on, you know, to, to make them catch on that uh, fever and you know, progress in their lives. And when you look at this uh, Nobel Prizes, you know, when you, after the Hugo's Medal, let us discuss about the Nobel Prizes. Of course, apart from Mary, Madam Mary Curie, who won it twice in two different disciplines. There have been many men who won two Nobel Prizes, but never in different disciplines. So she holds the record for both men and women that, you know, uh, only uh, person to hold this. And uh, we have 17 women who have won, sorry, 17 women who have won the Nobel Peace Prize, 15 who have won the Nobel Peace Prize in Literature, 12 for the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, five in Chemistry, and three in Physics, and two have won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Now, as a letter to you, dear women who are present here, and also to the men, uh, sometimes, you know, it, what happens is we tend to undermine our own worth and our, our work also. So don't be modest and speak up about your achievements. You know, uh, and most of the time, you don't even accept a compliment with grace. You know, as simple as you know, even saying that, "Hey, it looks like you have lost weight," and you say, "No, I think I will actually put on weight." You know, that's a simple compliment. And and think about if somebody says you have done excellent work, you would say, "I just got lucky," or you know, maybe I have to repeat this experiment again to check. You don't even accept compliments. So be sure about yourself. And use enabling language and tone. Don't be defensive. That doesn't mean that you have to be offensive. What I mean here is be assertive. Uh, you know, try to put forward your viewpoints in a very enabling language and tone. And connect your work to purposes and values. Like when I say this, you know, uh, women or even men who have small kids, you know, they will always come and ask you like, uh, Mama, what are you working on? I mean, what have you discovered? What have you invented? You know, when you say you're a scientist, this, the word discovery inventions, you know, like uh, electric bulb, what did you discover or invent? So connect it to the purpose, you know, tell them what research you're doing, how it affects the society at large, or how, you know, the larger gambit of things, how this helps uh, lessen the problems of the society, because ultimately science is for lessening the problems of the society. So, uh, if I can say it then, uh, people are talking about sex discrimination. What are you talking about? This guy doesn't even realize it because, you know, this lady is not even sitting in a chair. So, this man here doesn't even realize that there's a discrimination happening there already. And this cartoon depicts a glass ceiling. Don't be ridiculous. The sign just works fine. You know, when she points out that there's a sign which says no women. 
now i actually believe the things are changing this guy is now having a problem you know he's losing his secretaries earlier because they were getting married now they need to start their own companies so we have ceos who are women and this lady you know shows that you know she comes out and says i believe you wanted to see the man in charge she's in charge there well this is one of my favorite cartoons so this little boy is asking his mom mom why that sign men at work women work all the time when men work they need to put up signs so i guess this is to prove the point and uh, this was question women and science have no real career issues a true b false c who cares well so what is the take home message uh as i said i have now given you a few case studies of women in the past way back in uh, 370 ce to the current uh, 2008 uh, hugues medal awardee to the uh, current FR, first uh, women frs from india i have to tell you a story now you know uh, have you heard about this spider man i'm sure you know we are we were all you know uh, fans of some uh, superhero and spider man is one of the famous guys it turns out that uh, when this marvel's head editor uh, you know he was stanley he went to his publisher and said uh, uh, we want to start a new cartoon character and uh, he saw a spider and got inspired and said let, let me you know have this new superhero as spider man so this marvel publisher uh, you know uh, i think his name is good man he comes back and says uh, nonsense i mean uh, i am man as a superhero it's not going to work you know uh, but this editor somehow kind of you know convinces him uh, but he uh, eventually the publisher agrees only on one count that you know this will be the last uh, volume of this uh, series so because you know it's a last volume just it's accepted and you can publish this one story but lo and behold it became so famous that it is there even till now even today's generation kids love spider man so point is if you are convinced with an idea and genuinely believe it and don't let some idiot talk you out of it just trust and go ahead and you always have to look for that spark you know that really transforms you because uh, it, it is only one moment in your life you know which really changes the whole course of your life for it. i'll just give you some examples well we all know the story of uh, mahatma gandhi it was that push from the train on that night in south africa that transformed a lawyer mohandas ramchand gandhi into a mahatma gandhi and the defiance that triggered the anti apartheid movement in the making of the leader nelson mandela and that one look at the poor downtrodden people that changed a sister teresa into a saint mother teresa in fact uh, if you have to like you know talk about how that spark should come from within there's something which is actually holding uh, i'll explain this with a story there was once a king who had two falcons uh, one falcon was actually you know having a nice flight high above in the skies but the other one always used to sit in a branch so the king was you know quite worried uh, both are looking the same both the falcons look the same to me how is that one is flying so high in the sky and other one is always sitting in a branch of a tree so he calls his minister and tells him uh, hey you go and you know find some but guy who will train this falcon to fly high so this guy minister goes and finds a farmer and uh, you know the falcon starts flying next day the falcon is flying very high like the first falcon so the king is very pleased so he you know calls the minister and says how did you do it in just one day you made this you know falcon fly high so who who trained him to do this and this guy introduces this farmer to him he is like surprised a farmer i mean how did he manage to teach a falcon to fly and he said it was very simple i just cut the branch this falcon was sitting on this branch and it was very comfortable sitting there that 
he didn't want to explore his original potential to fly high right so to put it in the words of dr abdul kalam who was a former president of our country we are all born with wings and we will fly we have to fly we are born to fly so cut down on that branch which is holding you that fear that uh, you know that reason which is holding you back so cut that branch and find out how much higher you can fly well this is one story which i kind of you know uh, love to say uh, especially to younger audience uh, there was a little boy who went to his old grandpa and asked him what is the value of life well the grandpa now gave him a stone and said find out the value of this stone only condition is you should not sell it you find the value of it but you should not sell it so this boy takes this stone to an orange seller and asks him what is the value of the stone how much will you give this for he says he looks at it and says i'll give you 12 oranges a dozen oranges for this the boy says i'm sorry i'm not supposed to sell this and he just walks away from there then he goes to a vegetable seller and uh, he also looks at the stone and uh, then he says i'll give you one sack of potatoes for this stone the boy again says i'm sorry i'm not supposed to sell this and then goes to another person this time he goes to a jewelry shop so the jewelry or shop owner he sees the stone and says um oh, it's quite uh, shiny and good so i will give you two 22 carat gold necklaces for this the boy again explains that he can't send it then he goes to another person and this time he goes to a precious stone dealer so this precious stone dealer sees the stone you know he just puts it on a velvet cloth and goes round and round that and you know admires the stone and says where did you get this precious ruby it's priceless i mean even if i sell the whole world and my life i won't be able to purchase this priceless stone imagine the astonishment the boy would have got so he's further confused you know because uh, each one for the same stone remember it the stone did not change it's the same stone the orange seller told him he will give him a dozen oranges the vegetable guy says i'll give a potato sack of potatoes the jeweler says i'll give you two gold necklaces and the precious stone the dealer says i can't pay you the price it's priceless so he's totally confused now so he goes back to his grandpa so now this grandma grandfather says the answers you got from each of these people about the value of the stone is in their perception right so it is their financial status their level of information their belief in you and their motive behind entertaining you and their ambition it is not the actual value of the stone so but some day as the precious stone dealer did find a real value of that you will surely find someone who will discern your true value so the point is respect yourself don't sell yourself cheap you are unique and no one can ever ever replace you so know your worth your value so don't ask like for a lighter load you know most of the time we are always praying to god god please don't give me any trouble in my life you know like give me happiness don't give me problems but instead actually you should build yourself a strong bank or ask for god's gift to give you the strength to face those problems so the take home message is be the change you want to see in the world in fact there were many questions like you know what is the message as a young scientist or young mother with small children you have uh, how do you manage work life balance and all that it's it's you it's it starts with you you be the change you want to see in this world well uh, i would love to play this uh, video for which will just for a minute uh if you have young children you know you always are forced to watch cartoon movies but trust me there is a lot of life lessons which these cartoon movies teaches not only to the children but also to the adults 
Well, this is uh, typically a Kung Fu Panda movie where, uh, you know, uh, this Kung Fu Panda becomes the dragon warrior accidentally. And uh, some villainy guy is going to come and, you know, knock him off. Uh, but uh, he's told that there's one scroll. If he, you know, there's a, if he reads that scroll, he'll become the most powerful warrior in this world and he can knock out anybody. But eventually when he opens that scroll, he sees nothing in that. So, you know, he thinks, okay, that's, I'm gone. So I don't have any, you know, power and all that. So everybody is now vacating the village. So this guy also comes, uh, you know, to his home. And he meets his father. This is his father who's saying, okay, this is to him. Is nothing. Huh? You heard me. Nothing. There is no secret ingredient. Wait, wait. It's just plain old noodle soup? You don't add some kind of special sauce or something? Don't have to. To make something special, you just have to believe it's special. There is no secret ingredient. So there is no secret. There is no secret ingredient. It is you secret ingredient. who has to believe in yourself and you are the change. It all starts with you. So, well, as this uh, picture depicts here, the future is going to be full of surprises and unintended consequences. Be prepared. And this is uh, the, uh, you know, the Vindhya's Happy Women's Day, uh, you know, photo which the chair in Yas made for us. So, this is for all the women there in India's and everywhere in the world in GYA. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nishad, for such a wonderful uh, talk and sharing how the women scientists went through then and what is the situation now. So I think uh, there is a lot to work on and uh, we women scientists should, uh, you know, come together, work together and uh, empower each other through such discussions. So now I would see what questions are posed by women scientists here. Everybody is appreciating very practical solutions, excellent presentations, ex excellent talk. Thank you so much, Nishad, for such an energetic and wonderful talk. There is a very, very, uh, you know, common question. We have been having this question discussing for last three days. Yeah. How to balance the personal life, professional life. It, it, it's there, it's part. <laughs> so please. Well, uh, it is, it's very simple, you know. It is actually not a so-called professional life, personal life. It is your life, right? It's your life. So you have to decide whatever I do. Whatever I do, whether it's like, you know, taking care of my family or whether it is, you know, doing some experiments uh, in your lab, do it with fullest uh, passion and to your own satisfaction. Be happy about what you're doing. So that way you will know that, you know, uh, in fact, the previous speaker was also talking about how to prioritize things. So the moment you realize where your happiness lies, you know, at that moment, you will obviously know which takes the precedence over the other. So the prioritizing automatically will happen. You have to know yourself, know yourself. Then automatically the so-called work-life balance, which people say, you know, uh, is so difficult, especially for young mothers and all that, it will happen. It just will happen because you're taking control, right? You know where your happiness lies. It's simple as that. Yes. Yeah, there are all questions regarding work-life balance. So thank you so much, uh, Nishad, uh, for your wonderful talk. And we are, we are now formally and officially going to close because this is our third uh, day.
Yeah, there is one question like, uh, how do you manage yourself, especially time and roles? And we we all have our secrets, right? So everybody wants to know what's the secret, the secret ingredient for managing the time. <laughs> well, uh, time management uh, is uh, it's a, it's a big subject, which I'm sure you know many management gurus will give long lectures on that. Um, see, first and foremost. When you're at a job, at a particular task, when I say job task, it means both personal and professional. If you're a uh, fullest there, you know, it's not that, you know, you have something in your mind. Oh, I think, you know, I, I forgot to switch off the gas in my house. No, that should not happen when you're doing an experiment. And similarly, when you're spending time with your kids, your mind should not come back and say, oh, that experiment, I don't know what went wrong and why that result did not come the way I planned. No, be in that moment, when I say time, it's not the number of hours, you know, where you spend two hours uh, for reading literature, two hours for carrying out experiments. No, that's not the compartmentalization. Time means being present in that moment, in that task, what you're doing. If you're cooking, full-fledged, only cooking. If you're with your kids playing, only full-fledged playing with them, complete involvement, being present in that moment. Not worrying about, you know, other things. Uh, I'm supposed to send that grant, that paper, all that is there. But when you're doing your grant or, you know, writing a grant or uh, sending a paper, you, you, you concentrate completely in that moment, not worrying about what happens things back then. So that's how, you know, time management is not the number of hours, I repeat. It is being present in that moment, in that task completely is what leads to the effectiveness of the productivity. Wow, thank you so much Nishad for a wonderful explanation. So before we formally close, uh, I would like to give you more announcement. Uh, these were international webinar series and this was the first of its kind on gender equality, gender sensitization and women empowerment. And in the coming months, that is in July second week, we have another international webinar series on the same topic that is women empowerment. So. Stay tuned with us and also follow us on uh, Facebook group, Women Empowerment and Gender Equality and other announcements. So uh, join us again in the next month, uh, second week of July. So here there are a lot of early career women scientists, young scientists. So um, me uh, and Nishad, we both work on a common platform called as a Indian National Young Academy. Under Indian National Academy, which is an initiative by INSA, we, INSA is supporting us. And uh, so all the young women scientists, particularly, we call it as a vinyas, and we also do a uh, lot of programs together. In addition to that, I'm also associated very closely with Global Young Academy and being this year elected as an executive member. Uh, and last year I was a co-lead of Women in Science Working Group and I was actively involved in many of the activities for women empowerment at international level. So I would like to um, ask you if any one of you is ready to conduct or collaborate with Global Young Academy or Indian National Young Academy, we are very, very open for any of the projects or any of the collaboration. So I, I thank you very much uh, for your presence and attention. And now I formally request uh, Professor Mahanwa to put the concluding remarks and uh, thank you note for this program. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Salini. I think it seems I am again odd man out. Uh, I am the only male in this group. It seems like that. Uh, but it uh, doesn't matter, uh, of course. It's not this. true, sir. Actually, we want many men in the women's group. And then only I think there is a real equity and equality uh, ha will happen. So we want many, many men with us. In fact, today mm -hmm. I have been allowing many men to enter the meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's it. I think uh, they, this is the regular uh, affair, uh, even what we uh, see at our home. Uh, my wife is also a professional. She is a homeopath and she practices and she uh, finds these difficulties many times. I mean, balancing between the profession and the family. Uh, this is a regular affair. I really appreciate the efforts and the information given by 
Dr. In uh, uh, about her career, right? From what difficulties she had uh, during her uh, uh, master's, PhDs, and then uh, uh, how she managed and how uh, she uh, fit herself into a system. And that is what in and out, uh, that's what she has uh, exactly mentioned, which was really good uh, uh, guidelines for the young uh, career uh, ladies who are attended uh, this particular uh, uh, webinar. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Dr. Nishad Patimas, she has mentioned a lot about how the women were sidelined for a long time in uh, Royal Society and uh, in, even in Nobel Laureate uh, and also so many places. But now I think that is not the situation. Uh, in olden days, even uh, the education for ladies were not allowed. But now that is not the case. Uh, now we are talking about 50-50% uh, contribution by women in the academics and education. So this is good, good growth is happening, good things are happening all across the globe. And I hope these kind of programs are needed to sensitize the society altogether. So uh, whatever reservations still there are with the men uh, about the uh, a career or career orientation of women that can be a little bit loosened out and that can ladies can work freely, they, they can spend a little more time and we men can share some responsibility at home, at, uh, at home also. Uh, I think we, uh, uh, in last three days, we had total participants and uh, success around 200. And that's uh, itself, it seems like uh, a good response for this webinar. I really uh, thank both the speaker, today's speakers, who have put up their efforts and uh, uh, brought out very relevant uh, information for the young scientists and more specifically for women scientists. I uh, uh, formally thank uh, our uh, vice chancellor who has uh, permitted us to go for this webinar and i really thank uh, professor padma devarajan who took initiative and uh, uh, sort of this program came true and uh, one of very very important the maximum effort put up by uh, dr shalini arya and uh, her uh, good contacts all across the globe could make this program more, uh, uh, what I can say, uh, fruitful. And I hope uh, definitely we will definitely organize some of the same kind of program with a major, uh, with the maximum possible participation, uh, not only by webinar, but even physical form when the, this pandemic situation can come to the uh, normal stage. Uh, we definitely can uh, give better platforms to the mini people. Uh, I really thank all the participants uh, who uh, sought out that they will attend this program even though the program schedule timings were different. I mean, very first day, the program time was different. Second day, the program time was different. Third day, program time was different. But still, everybody sought out that they will attend this program and that itself indicates what kind of speakers we have. Because people will join these webinars only and only when the speakers are good, speakers are of a particular quality, and that itself indicates what effort put in by uh, Dr. Stalini Arya definitely fetch maximum pos pa pa possible participant for this program. And uh, definitely I uh, thank all the participants and expect to join for some other programs, either in webinars or in physical form. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, your encouraging and inspiring words. And, and that really means a lot and that motivate us to work in future. So, yes, you were saying something? No, oh, it's pleased to you now. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Padma Devrajan. Thank you again, Professor Nishad, for your wonderful talk. And most important, our enthusiastic audiences who could make it for all the three days. I'm extremely sorry that the time of the webinar was different because some of the speakers, you know, were international and to manage with the time with their continent, I had to shift the timing uh, like uh, here and there. So, so uh, I, I really uh, say sorry for that, but then I, I'm sure we have got a lot of insight from all the sessions and it was wonderful. 
although this lockdown uh, is there and there are a lot of negative things but many of we, us have um, converted this negative period into a very positive and conducting and attending such webinar series is one outcome of that and uh, although we cannot uh, bring it to you know actual physical uh, level of um, you know uh, that uh, life into this webinar series but still i will try uh, to bring a little bit if anyone would like to come start, uh, start the video and talk or interact with some of us you're free to do and those who are bored by attending the lecture are free to end this meeting and those who would like to stay here can interact with me i'm here for next 15 to 20 minutes Shalini, I'll take leave. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor Mandana, for nice compliments and uh, yes, motivation yes, yes. for sharing. <laughs> the sessions were great, in fact. Thanks to TechIP for sponsoring and Professor Manohar. And you, I mean, as a convener, have done a wonderful, wonderful job. So thank you for that. <laughs>